Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for coming out in such large numbers today at such an important time for Yale and for the United States. I'd like to thank the mayor of New Haven, John DeStefano, for being here. And, and my great friend and former colleague, your member of Congress, Rosa DeLauro. Thank you, Rosa, for being here. Thank you. And I have two other friends who, like me, are no longer in public office, but each in their own way, they made a great difference to whatever good we were able to do. Kurt Schmoke, the former mayor of Baltimore. And uh, my great partner, Ernesto Zedillo, the former president of Mexico. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for being here. I also have seen uh, already today a lot of people who were members of our administration. There are five or six of them out there. And so I appreciate Yale giving us the pretext to hold the Clinton alumni meeting here today. <laughs> I was privileged to study here for exactly 1% of Yale's 300 years. I love the law school. I, uh, I loved my professors and have stayed in touch with many of them over all these long years. One of them I was able to put on the Court of Appeals. One of them I tried to torment in class with disagreements, and he lived to torment me, my constitutional law professor, Robert Bork. And we had a great set of debates 30 years ago that, now that I replay them in my mind, seem fresh today. I was fortunate enough to be here at Yale Law School with a phenomenal number of outstanding men and women who were my fellow students. One of them did become the United States Senator from New York. And, Senator Schumer went to Harvard. <laughs> Meeting Hillary was the best thing that happened to me at Yale, and maybe the only thing that really stuck over all these 30 years. <laughs> I understand there was some discussion here in the Yale community about whether this tercentennial should go forward in the aftermath of the awful events of September the 11th. I thank you for going forward. It is what President Bush asked us to do when he asked us to get on with our lives. And it is particularly important at this time. Marking 300 years of learning at any time would be a significant event. But marking it at this time with a commitment to be a truly global university is obviously profoundly important. For 300 years, beginning three quarters of a century before the Declaration of Independence. Yale has taught young people the wisdom of the past, the analysis of the present, and the importance of looking to the future. Yale has asked the hard questions and looked for honest answers. That is what I found here 30 years ago, and that's what I see when I look out on this vast array of faces today. America is full of hard questions now. 
I have spent a great deal of the last three weeks in Manhattan visiting the crisis center, visiting Ground Zero, visiting fire stations and police headquarters, going to three schools, two of them double schools because the children were blown out of their schools by the events of September the 11th. And I have found so many questions. Hillary and I went to an elementary school in Lower Manhattan where nine and 10-year-old students asked me these questions. Why do they hate us so much anyway? How did that guy get all those people to commit suicide? I never thought I'd hear a nine-year-old ask a question like that. The other day I had a conversation with Mike McClarty, who was my first chief of staff and is my oldest friend. We go back to the time when we were three and four years old. And we were talking about the events of September the 11th, and we had a conversation that I would bet thousands and thousands of Americans our age have had in the last three weeks. I said, Mac, if we'd been on that plane over Pennsylvania, you think we'd have had the guts to take it down? He said, I think so, and I hope so. I've gotten calls from women friends of Hillary's and mine who are the mothers of young children from all over America with a simple question. Bill, is it going to be all right? Tell me it's going to be all right. Well, first of all, it's going to be all right. I can tell you that. Terrorism, the killing of innocent people for political or religious or economic reasons, is as old as organized combat. It has been around a very long time. If we searchingly look through history honestly, we find it in uncomfortable places. In the crusade in which the European Christians seized Jerusalem, they burned a mosque and slaughtered 300 Jews and killed every woman and child on the Temple Mount who was a Muslim. But no campaign of terror standing on its own without organized military combat has ever succeeded in all of human history. Indeed, it is not the purpose of terror to succeed militarily. It is the purpose of terror to terrify. And I would guess that a lot of young people in this audience today who have never lived through such a difficult crisis were understandably terrified. And what is sought from the terror is a people who are afraid. First of all, in a vast and diverse country like ours, if you look around this crowd today, you see we've got people here from just about every country, every racial and ethnic group, and every religious heritage. What is sought is, first of all, to make us afraid of each other, and secondly, to make us afraid of the future. We're afraid to plan, afraid to invest, afraid to trust. That is what they seek. Therefore, terrorism cannot prevail unless we cooperate. It is not a military strategy, it is a psychological and human one. We have to give the people who attacked us permission to win, and I do not believe we are about to grant them that permission. Mr. Bin Laden and his allies misjudge America. They think we are fundamentally a weak, greedy, selfish, materialistic people. They think we are weakened by our lack of a national religion and an imposed social order. 
but they are wrong. All Americans have been proud in these last days of the performance of our leaders, from the president to the governor, the mayor of New York, yes, to our senators. I'm very proud of my wife and her colleagues in the House and the Senate, but especially the people. Hillary and I went to a Rosh Hashanah service the other night in our little village of Chappaqua because we lost a person out of the temple on September the 11th. And I met one of the two men there who escaped from the 84th floor of the World Trade Center carrying a disabled woman all the way to safety. When I went into the Family Crisis Center the first day, a man came up to me and said, <clears throat> well, Mr. President, I haven't seen you since Oklahoma City. And I said, uh, how did I see you there? He said, you came to console me. My wife was blown up in the bombing in Oklahoma City. And I had no one to talk to. So when I saw that this had happened, I went into my job and I told my boss I was taking two weeks off. I got in my car and I drove here. And I sit here all day, every day, talking to people. I had no one to talk to and I thought I might be of help. I have visited many of the firemen. Oh, the fire department is a marvelous organization in a modern world. It's more like a medieval army where instead of sitting behind and issuing orders, the leaders lead. And so in our fire department, we lost the chief, his three top aides, the chaplain, and some 200 other officers. 340 killed, necessitating over 200 promotions because no one took a back seat when it came to sacrifice. I think those who believe that we would be weakened by this have misjudged them. All over America, there has been a tremendous outpouring of caring, over $600 million given by Americans, everything from a dollar to millions. I thank the, work, uh, the people at Yale for the work you did for those who lost loved ones or feared they had and caring for them here. We are going to be all right. Still, we must realize that we have a formidable adversary and a difficult challenge, partly because in every conflict throughout human history, defense lags offense by a little bit. And we got caught not being caught up, as has always happened. But so far, the human race is still around because self-preservation and decency catches up and triumphs. Nevertheless, I think we have to take this seriously and see it for exactly what it is. I believe we are engaged in the first great struggle for the soul of the 21st century. We must understand terrorism in the context of the modern world, and we must ask ourselves what we have to do, not only to combat terrorism and protect ourselves, but to undermine the conditions and attitudes which bring to terror's banner foot soldiers and sympathizers. If I had asked you on September the 10th the following question, what would your answer be? What is the dominant trait of the world in the early 21st century? If you're an optimistic person, it seems to me you might have given one of four answers. You might have said, well, it's the globalization of economy and, and culture that has lifted more people out of poverty in the last 20 years than at any time in all history and brought America unparalleled wealth and opportunity, including opportunity for first-generation immigrants from all over the world. Or you might have said, if you're a techie, it's the information technology revolution. 
When I became president in January of 1993, there were 50 sites, 5-0 sites, on the World Wide Web. When I left office, there were 350 million. There has never been anything like it in the history of communications. Or you might have said, if you're a scientist, it's the revolution in sciences. We're going to find out what's in the black holes in outer space. Last year, we found two new species of life at the deepest parts of previously unexplored rivers. The human genome has been sequenced. And soon, young women of childbearing years will bring home babies from the hospital with a little gene card saying, here are your kids' problems, here are your kids' strengths. If you do the following 10 things, you'll reduce the problems dramatically. And very soon, babies born in America and in any country with a good health system will have a life expectancy in excess of 90 years. We have scientists working on digital chips to replicate the nerve functions of damaged nerves in the spinal cord, raising the prospect that a chip might perform for the spine what a pacemaker does for the heart, and people thought permanently paralyzed might be able to get up and walk. And all of this is truly amazing. Or if you're a political scientist, you might say the dominant trait of this period is the explosion of democracy around the world and diversity at home. Just in the last three years, for the first time in all of human history, more than half the world's people live under governments of their own choosing. It has never happened before. And in our country, and indeed in most other countries with a strong economy, there is an absolute explosion of diversity. America's a lot more interesting place than it was 30 years ago. If we'd had this meeting 30 years ago, you wouldn't look like you do. <laughs> and it's a lot more fun to be here and a lot more educational and a lot more exciting because of that. So it seems to me, if you're optimistic, and on September the 10th, I'd say, what's the dominant trait of the early 21st century world? You could have given one of those four positive answers. The global economy, information technology, the scientific revolution, the explosion of democracy and diversity. On the other hand, if you're a little more pessimistic, or if you are what Hillary refers to in our family as her being the designated warrior, you might mention four negative things. You might have said, well, all those positive things are just fine, but the environmental crises facing us are so great they threaten to engulf all our process, progress and let it go away. Nine of the hottest years ever recorded occurred in the last 12. If the climate warms at the same rate for the next 50 years it has in the last 10, we'll lose 50 feet of Manhattan Island Pacific Island nations, the Florida Everglades I worked so hard to save. Agricultural productions will be disrupted all over the world. Millions and millions of food refugees will be created, and there'll be a lot more battles out there. There's a terrible water shortage in the world already, and one in four people on the globe never get a clean glass of water. There's a serious deterioration in the quality of our oceans, which are responsible for so much of our oxygen and other things essential to life on this planet. So you could say, doesn't look to me like there's much going on about this, and if we don't reverse these, we're going to be in terrible problems. Or you could say, no, no, before that happens, we'll be engulfed by health crises, the breakdown of health systems all over the world, and the rise of epidemics. This year, one in four people in the world will die of AIDS, TB, malaria, or infections related to diarrhea. 36 million people have AIDS, but in five years, 100 million will if we don't reverse present trends. And the fastest growing rates are in the former Soviet Union, on Europe's back door, in the Caribbean, on our front door, in India, the world's greatest democracy, and China just admitted they have twice as many AIDS cases as they had previously thought, and only 4% of the adults know how the disease is contracted and spread. So you can say, well, when we have 100 million AIDS cases, it's going to collapse a lot of these democracies, and it's a recipe for total turmoil and violence. Or you could say, 
No, the real problem is the flip side of globalization. Half the world's people aren't a part of it. It is true that more people have been lifted out of poverty by globalization in the last 20 years than ever before. It is also true that half the people in the world still live on less than $2 a day. That a billion of our people still live on less than a dollar a day. Think about it next time you buy a cup of coffee. A billion people go to bed hungry every night. One woman dies every minute in childbirth. And that is a recipe for revolution. Compounded by the fact that 100 million of our children on the globe never go to school at all. Half the kids in Africa and a quarter of the kids in East Asia and the Indian subcontinent. So you might have said that. Or even on September 10th, you might have said, no, the biggest problem is going to be terrorism. Coupled with weapons of mass destruction, and rooted in racial and religious and ethnic hatred. Now here's what I would like to say. Whether you would have given a positive answer or a negative answer, there's something that all eight of these elements, positive and negative, have in common. They all reflect the astonishing increase in global interdependence. The extent to which we have seen the collapse of distances and barriers bringing us closer together for good or ill. Terrorism is simply the dark side of our increasing interdependence. We have not repealed human nature or the fact that some people see reality very differently than we do. And it was inevitable if we take down all the barriers, if we open the society, that people who represent organized forces of destruction would take advantage of the very forces which have made us richer, more diverse, freer, and made our lives better. Therefore, all the great questions of the 21st century boil down to one. Is this new age going to be good or bad on balance for me, my family, my community, my nation, and the world. That's why Yale's mission in its fourth century to build a truly global university is so important. It is very important that it be good. I was delighted, Mr. President, when uh, my former Deputy Secretary of State and my old roommate, Strobe Talbot, became the head of your new Center for the Study of Globalization, and his wife agreed to run the Royal Fellows Program. I actually said I'd like to be a world fellow, and I was informed that I no longer qualify as a young leader. <laughs> so today you are stuck with my opinions without the benefit of further Yale study. <laughs> what do we have to do to make sure that we encourage the positive forces of interdependence and we restrain and combat the negative ones. I would like to make three points. First, first things first, we have to defend ourselves against terrorism. I want you to know that there are good people, lots of them, who've been working on this for years. I want you to know, if you don't, that there are many, many more attacks which were planned on the United States which were thwarted by career public servants and on our allies. At the last millennium alone, there was a plan for a bomb in Boston, a bomb in Seattle, a bomb at the Los Angeles airport, a bomb at the biggest hotel in Amman, Jordan, and a bomb at one of the holiest Christian sites in the Holy Land, and a half a dozen other plans all thwarted. There are good people who are working hard. Nonetheless, clearly there is more to do to build our defenses, to build our ability to be offensive, to build our capacity to maximize computer networks to follow people who mean us harm. I don't want to say more about that right now because the President, his national security team, and our allies have some tough tactical decisions to make. And I think we ought to stick with them. 
give them the room they need to make the decision. So far, they've been making good decisions, and we have no reason to believe that they won't do so in the future. I think on this, it's important for America to stay united. We are, and we must stay that way. Now, and I will say again, I know it, it was frightening to have the first massive attack on American soil. And nothing can minimize the human loss. But let me remind the young people here that the century we just left was the bloodiest in all human history. 12 million died in World War I, 20 million between the wars, more than 20 million in World War II, another 20 million from government oppression after the war, not counting the millions who died in Korea and Vietnam, later in senseless slaughter from Rwanda to Bosnia. The world has never been free of violence, and we took down the walls and collapsed the distances. We are interdependent, and therefore all the things that we have benefited from in this global economy carried with it the price tag of rendering ourselves more vulnerable to those who would do us harm. But we will catch up, and this will be handled. What we have to do as citizens is to think about what else has to be done and what else we personally can do. We have to lead an assault on the conditions of negative interdependence and create more opportunities for positive interdependence. America should continue to work to reduce poverty and to spread the benefits of globalization to people in countries that haven't felt it with things like more debt relief, more microcredit, more sensible trade. America should contribute its fair share to the Secretary General's health fund to fight the spread of the AIDS epidemic and the other health plagues facing the world. America should deal with the challenge of climate change through conservation, through the development of alternative energy, through helping our friends and neighbors throughout the world do the same. America should continue to promote democracy. One particular problem we have in the present crisis is that so many people who hear the siren song of radical Islamic fundamentalism and a twisting of the reading of the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad live in countries which are growing ever larger, ever younger, and ever poorer, where there is no democracy and no chance to express dissent or even assent in a normal political way. And it keeps the populace in a state of sort of permanent infancy in which you never have to take responsibility for your own lives and making it better because you never get to take responsibility and therefore it's very easy to listen to someone say your problems were caused by America's success. It's a hard case to make because people from all those countries come to America and share in the success. It's a hard case to make because America last used its military power to protect poor Muslims in Bosnia and Kosovo. It's a hard case to make because America led the world in the most sweeping and important debt relief ever because the money had to be used by poor countries for education, health care, or development, and nothing else. But nonetheless, if you never get to vote, you never get to run for office, you never get to stand up in the public forum and say what you think, you are permanently disempowered, and you can hear the siren song, it's all because of America. So we have to keep urging our friends to find ways to move to greater democracy and freedom. And finally, let me say this. Even more important than what we do is who we are. We must understand that this present conflict, as agonizing as the loss was, is about far more than the buildings collapsing and the people dying. 
This is about a global force with a fundamentally different view of the nature of truth, the value of life, the character of human community. Mr. bin Laden and the Taliban believe they have the truth. And everybody that agrees with them is good, and everybody that doesn't is evil. This great university is dedicated to the proposition that nobody has the absolute truth. We all get to vote. We have the right of freedom of speech. We have the right of freedom of religion. We have the right of freedom of assembly. And we have the responsibilities of a free people because we believe that fundamentally life is a journey where we move closer and closer to the truth. But because we are finite, limited human beings, never fully achieve it. Therefore, we do not have the right to impose our iron will on others. Instead, we try to work with others. And the more the merrier in the thought that with honest effort together, we might find more truth. That is a fundamental difference. And it leads people to a different view of the value of human life. Because we believe we're all traveling on this journey together, we have come over time more and more and more to value all life, to think that everybody counts, that everybody deserves a chance. But for them, they believe there are three kinds of people. There are the people that embrace their particular view of Islam. Then there are the Muslims who don't agree with their reading of the Koran who keep citing surahs like God put different, Allah put different people on the earth, not that they might despise one another, but that they might come to know one another and learn from one another. They hate that one in Afghanistan. People who believe that are heretics to them. And the rest of us who are not Muslims are infidels. We're all combatants in the war. And we all deserve whatever happens to us, including death, even if it's a six-year-old girl who decided on the morning of September the 11th to go with her mother to work in the World Trade Center. Of all the things that I have seen and been moved by this last few weeks, the thing that I will carry with me to the grave is the lines of the victims' families holding their little flyers. Because for days and days and days, people didn't even know whether their loved ones were in the building when it was hit. So they all made up flyers. And they had pictures of their loved ones. This is my wife, my husband, my brother, my sister, my mother, my father, my child. Here's the picture. And then outside, and often in handwriting, this is what floor they were on. This is how tall they were. This is how much they weighed. All these people holding these pictures. There were Indians and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis and Japanese and Chinese and British and German. There were Mexicans and Chileans. There were people from every conceivable religious faith. They were all there. A stunning rebuke to the people who thought they had the right to kill them because they had the whole truth. We believe in a different character of community. We believe we all do better when we work together. And all you have to do in our country is to accept the rules of engagement. Our rules about everybody counting, everybody getting a voice, everybody getting a vote, people having to show up every day and do what's right. It gives us the freedom to celebrate our diversity that we can be united by our common humanity. Their community is not united by common humanity, it's united by what it is not. And Mr. bin Laden has a political agenda. He wants to take over Saudi Arabia, get rid of Israel, and purge the whole Middle East of all the apostates so that it'll always look, all look like the Taliban. What a dreary world. We have seen in the pictures that we've seen on television from that movie, Behind the Veil, what their ideas are like, forcing the women to wear those horrid burqas, beating them with sticks in public, and worse. But this is a formidable adversary because they do not believe they're evil, but they believe they are doing good. 
the most important thing over and above anything we do is that we have in our minds clearly the world we are trying to make that our wealth is not an end in itself but a tool to allow people to live up to their God-given abilities that we have to keep struggling to get beyond these categories of difference to our common humanity and we should never be blind to how hard it's going to be think of the great spirits of the last 50 years Gandhi killed not by a Pakistani Muslim but by one of his own Hindus who hated him because he wanted India for the Muslims, for the Sikhs, for the Jains, for everybody. Sadat killed by the organization that Mr. Bin Laden's number two heads now. Not by an Israeli, but by an Egyptian who hated him for reaching across the religious and ethnic and bloody divide to make peace. My friend at Sakra Bean, a lifetime defending Israel, killed not by a Palestinian terrorist, but by an Israeli who hated him because he wanted to lay down arms and take up peace. This is hard. I thank God that of all the great spirits of the last 50 years, Mandela survived, probably only because he first had to pay with 27 years of the best years of his life in jail. It is hard to get people beyond the notion that they are defined by their differences and not their common humanity. But you can do it by living it, and you can do it by recognizing that it is time to take America's eternal mission to the world, a mission to widen the circle of opportunity, to deepen the meaning of freedom, to strengthen the bonds of community, we can no longer deny to others what we claim for ourselves. That is the ultimate lesson of the interdependent world. We're going to get through this crisis. Our leaders are going to make good decisions. But in the end, we not only have to stop bad things from happening, we have to build for you the best, most prosperous, most peaceful, most exciting time the world has ever known. And we can do it if we remember who we are and what we believe. Thank you, and God bless you.